The Labor Department says inflation in the U.S. jumped 7 percent between December 2020 and December 2021. That's the biggest increase since 1982. Price increases for used cars and housing played a huge role in driving the surge. People are also paying more for food, clothing, and furniture. However, energy and gas prices did see a decline. Core inflation, which excludes food and energy, jumped 5.5%. That's the largest 12-month increase since February 1991. For more on this, I want to bring in Peter Morisi. He's an economist and emeritus professor at the University of Maryland. Peter, thank you for joining us. First of all, what does this data from the Labor Department say about the current state of our nation's economy? Well, that it's overheated. Uh, we really have more demand than we have supply for two reasons. We still have a great deal of stimulus money in the hands of consumers, about two and a half trillion dollars, adding in businesses, three trillion dollars. It's not yet spent. You know, checks that went in the mail, they're in their bank accounts. And the other thing is what Americans buy has changed. So whereas they're not buying sandwiches downtown because they're not commuting, they're buying more goods to make their homes more comfortable. And they're buying homes and putting on additions further from the city. These things stress the system and our capacity to supply. It's just not just container ships backed up at Long Beach. So, I mean, one thing, as you mentioned, is the stimulus payment. What else is causing this spike in inflation? And how are these prices increasing everyday household items uh, or increasing the price in them that, that we buy? Well, two things about everyday items is they are significantly more expensive. And in some cases, you can't get them. You know, I uh, eat Pepperidge Farm white bread. My wife hasn't been able to find it in the stores for two weeks. It's little things like that. Uh, we, we pop corn every night. One week we couldn't find popcorn, if you can believe that. These are not things that are reported, they're made right here. Part of that is the shift from people eating in restaurants to you know, eating, eating at home and, and, and the different supply chains involved. But another part of it, frankly, is that you notice the stock market's doing pretty well. Corporate profits have done well in all this because they've raised prices and they've paid more for wages, but they've raised price is more than wages. And most folks are really behind when it comes to the, the cost of living. They, they've got, we've gone backwards. Uh, there was this notion, uh, you know, among progressives that, that somehow or other a, a bit more inflation would be good for people. Unfortunately, we have more than a bit more. We have a lot more. Mm, that could potentially continue driving that wedge and, and uh, opening up the wealth gap. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell on Tuesday warned rising inflation could make it harder to fully restore, restore the job market. What, why is that? What does he mean? What's the relationship between these two things? Well, essentially, to curb inflation, you have to curb demand. And, and that does make the labor market you know, less a seller's market for workers. We have never curbed an inflation of this magnitude without having a recession of some kind. Now, sometimes it occurs naturally. For example, the Korean War, we had a big burst in prices because the government was buying a lot of stuff. Then when the war stopped, the government stopped buying. Prices went down, but so did employment. We had a recession. Uh, more recently, Paul Volcker had a terrible time with inflation that was you know, about 10%. And he had a really jack interest rates up all the way, causing two recessions back to back to bring that inflation under control, which took several years. Uh, we have never really broken the back of an inflation this strong without facing a recession. You know, the Fed has said that it expects to increase to raise interest rates at least three times this year. And some experts say potentially four times to ease infl inflation. What do you make of this strategy? It's very timid. Uh, to put it in perspective, He's got 7% inflation. Paul Volcker had 10. Over nine months, if we have four interest rate increases, that's a one percentage point increase in the overnight bank lending rate and maybe a half a percentage point on the rate that people pay on cars and, and things and mortgages and things like that. Over the same nine-month period, when Paul Volcker hit the brakes, he raised interest rates seven percentage points, wow. seven times as much. And that didn't do the job. The economy fell into a recession, he eased up, inflation started again, and he took interest rates all the way to 17% in order to break the back. This is a very, very tepid response, and it's largely in response to the political pressures. It's going to be very interesting to hear what we, what, what 
he has to say after his confirmation is completed, because he is faced with some very nasty work to do. In a perfect world, I mean, what solution do you think would be more helpful? Um, there really isn't a perfect world. Unfortunately, we printed a lot of money to get out of the pandemic recession and probably printed too much. And I was reflecting on this with my wife this afternoon, who edits all my columns, and I said, you know, we can't lay this all on President Biden. After all, we printed $5 trillion worth of money, or close to that. And not all of that money was spent, you know, for President Biden. Some of it was spent for President Trump. If Mr. Biden had done nothing on coming into the White House, we'd still have about $1 trillion left in unspent stimulus money out there. So to say it's all on him, but the reality is it's there, and now it has to be sucked out of the system. What the Fed has to do is dramatically increase interest rates and start selling off the bonds on its balance sheet to suck money out of the system. That's going to cause, frankly, a reduction in the demand for labor. It may cause a recession. It likely will, actually. But, you know, if we don't endure one now, it's going to be much worse later because we're on our way to 10 percent inflation if we don't do something about this. Now, with those, uh, if, if uh, interest rates go up, say, four times or three times this year, how long do you think it'll take before inflation reaches its peak and finally starts to decline? I don't have a good answer for that because we haven't been through a pandemic like this since the bubonic plague. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, not even the, uh, the, 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 the Spanish flu was quite like this because the government purposely shut down the economy. So we really don't have, you know, any, any historical basis. The econometric models we have are constantly wrong. They keep telling us inflation is going to revert back down to 2%. My feeling is that if they keep going along as they have, and we pass Build Back Better, and that has to be financed, that we could hit 10% inflation by the end of the Biden administration or the end of the Biden first term. Uh, con con conversely, if we do nothing further and we do raise interest rates, they'll, inflation will come down a bit, but it won't come down to where we want it to be. You know, he could be facing re-election with 4 or 5% inflation and not much of a legislative track record. I Peter mean, Maurice, we can talk all we no. want about the desirability of the things he wants to do, but they will be paid for with inflation if we go ahead as planned. Well, these are unprecedented uh, times. Peter Morisi, thank you for joining us tonight. It's been my pleasure.